now I'm glad to talk about uh, corporate actorhood and in, uh, in, in my view, really interesting paper on the issue, namely Elias Kalias is a firm and individual. Time is short, so let me start straight away with an introductory remark. Uh, in December 2017, U.S. District Judge uh, Sean Cox sentenced Oliver Schmidt, as most of you will know, former Volkswagen engineer to seven years in prison. Some uh, times Judge Cox told Schmidt uh, apologetically his job requires him to imprison good people just making very, very bad decisions. Uh, Schmidt was a henchman, everyone understood, uh, uh, said independent newsroom ProPublica, and his sentence could stand in. Uh, in case you are not exactly satisfied with this kind of stand-in sentences or charges addressing responsibi responsibility to, to just a few individual actors, most of them henchmen, as ProPublica called them, possibly good people making bad decisions, you should or even have to think about corporate actors. One of the most interesting and astute contributions to this concept and the way it is discussed and disputed within economics and in particular within uh, uh, ins new institutional economics is Elias Kalliels is the Thurman Individual, Cambridge Journal of Economics 1997. I just uh, read it some months ago just. Um, uh, and I have to say in advance that Kalliel uses the term individual in quite a different way than it's usual uh, within the debate about individual uh, uh, as opposed to corporate actors. Uh, in short, individuals, individuals for Khalil are non-decomposable entities in the context of the uh, theory of the firm, purposeful actors, be it corporate actors or natural persons. Khalil's title question therefore amounts to the question, is uh, the firm a corporate actor? And as we will see, his answer is yes. Now, uh, my point one is, before going deeper into this concept and Khalil's contribution, it is worth mentioning that there is a strong tradition, effective from Adam Smith times up to our days, uh, which maintains an understanding of organizations as mere instruments of their participants. Adam Smith is an example but still Erich Gutenberg, Dorian, the post-war Betriebswirtschaftslehre, uh, considered organization simply as instrument der Unternehmensführung, instrument of management. And even Herbert Simon in administrative, administrative behavior considered organization uh, to be a vehicle to achieve human objectives uh, when saying, I quote, in a very real sense, the leader or the superior is merely a bus driver who, whose passenger will leave him unless he takes them in the direction they wish to go. Note that implied with the bus driver passenger metaphor, it is a voluntary nature of following a leader, and I will come uh, back to uh, later. Point two, before getting to his own idea, however, in his Cambridge Journal paper, Khalil uh, deals with answers given by economists, in fact, particular institution, new institutional economists, those rejecting and others more or less approving the notion of firms as corporate actors, Arkin Demsitz, Jensen Meckling, Oliver Hart, um, Coase and Williamson, of course, Hayek and uh, Victor Van Berg. Khalil's critique regarding these authors is really sophisticated in my view. I cannot go into it, uh, I'm sorry, it's really a pity, uh, but just can summarize, they make use all of them make use of one or more of the uh, criteria uh, listed on the slide. Um, you ha might have a look at it uh, under point two. Um, and these criteria are in, in Khalil's view insufficient to establish a well-grounded concept of firms as non-decomposable uh, integrated individuals as corporate actors. And criteria such as clear market firm dichotomy, ownership, power relations, goal direction, and so on. 
To be sure, these are necessary conditions. Some authors, however, have troubles to meet the market firm distinction. Some others go directedness. Uh, still others, the distance, um, the, the distinction of um, goal directedness on the one hand and intentionality on the other and so on. What in Khalil's view is missing in all these approaches based just on one or more of these criteria, um, in short, is the common consented goal idea. This is uh, what uh, Hartmut Kling, uh, Klimt uh, would uh, contradict as I understand it. Um, um, cons common consented goal. Uh, what I would like to call an emergent organizational intentionality, emergent meaning not redu reducible without rest to the members' motives, goals, or purposes. This in Khalil's and in my view, indeed marks the specific difference to more loosely covered alliances such as markets, networks, or cartels, which are based just on mutual interests, not on common goals, but mutual interests and due to the lack of commonality cannot for Khalil count as individuals. And this, by the way, means firms have interests themselves qua firms. Point three, Khalil's paper is mainly about the issue of, as he calls it, firm's purpose. And I, for my part, have suggested to focus not just on what organizations will, but what, on what they can, uh, what they can cause. Consequently, one has to take into consideration the enormous resources firms and not just their members have at their disposal in com comparably to more than uh, to natural persons have. Point four, the, to, uh, to the question, are there such things as, as corporate intentions? The answer in my view should not, not just be yes, but yes and organizational intentions are even much stronger than personal ones. Stronger in the sense of the aspects listed on the slide under point four, selectivity and one-sidedness of goals and purposes, resource equipment suited to enable goal achievement, and in particular, power to influence legal and political regulations. We had this issue in, in the morning session, keyword rent seeking and public communication. Point five, can and do the firm members orient themselves toward some organizational goals such as profits or as Simon once uh, suggested production of goods and services. An alternative would be they adhere not to goals, but just to the organization's rules and to instructions. There may be, however, and as Khalil insists, there has to be a certain commitment. Some loyalty may be a la Hirschman referring to the firm as a whole and its goal, which amounts to what uh, Khalil calls a common consented goal. This is because what is needed for organization on the part of the members uh, is not just following rules and instructions and not only seeking for personal gains as offered by incentive systems, but contributions going far beyond, which are not and cannot be stipulated, be it required by rules or ordered by superiors or just aroused by uh, in incentives. Contributions uh, such as uh, one example, taking charge behavior, desirable, but not in any case to obtain by force, helping behaviors, or uh, for example, the willingness of doctors and nurses and staff in times of COVID-19, more generally of all employees to cope with, with exceptional situations. And note that every situation is in some sense singular and exceptional. Some, uh, but by far not all of these kinds of willingness may be the subject matter of implicit contracts. So far we conclude with Khalil, there is such thing as a common goal of organizations employees refer to, often have to refer to in their everyday practices. Point six, regarding Khalil, there remains one reservation, however, it's about the accident of, on the voluntary nature of what he calls mostly uh, cons consent, 
some take, sometimes taking a sideways glance to Simon's acceptance. It was already in my PhD thesis that I criticized that Barnard and Simon leveraged the difference between voluntary agreement on the one hand and forced submitting by and through the term acceptance, more or less uh, im or explicitly uh, taking it as, uh, as voluntary acceptance. Between slavery and free autonomy, however, there's a lot in between. And there can be no question, in my view, that, say, employees in call centers in, in the retail, meat, construction or textile industry, to name just a few, cannot be placed just at the freedom end of this scale. Do they consent to the goal of their respective firms or rather to specific reference groups or communities and partial particular sub goals of organizational subunits, projects and the like? And I will go to this now. Point seven, rather people will refer to some department group or project goal or to more short run goals such as annual, monthly or even weekly sales. So how, how are we going to take into account that the usual everyday reference of decision-making will be to factorize particular goals, not always consistent with each other, nor with some overall goal? What can consent to a common goal mean then? Remember that uh, Hartmut Klimt said there is no such thing as a common goal. There is no consent, that there is dissent goal. My answer is, in a way, analogous uh, to what Michael Burrow outlined as manufacturing consent. In our case, not though with respect to the rules, but to the fragmented particular goals. Um, analogous to Burrow's not uh, famous saying, uh, quote, um, playing games generates consent with respect to its rules. Transferred to our issue of consented goals, it would read to paraphrase real world, going for factorized goods, goals, generates consent to the common goal, a precarious, half-hearted, just halfway intended consent, that is. Remarkable in this uh, uh, Burawa insight for me is the awareness of the ambiguities of what consent may include and the acknowledgement of emergence implicit in the manufacturing consent idea, the emergence and for that matter, the implied uh, quasi separatedness of personal intentions and the firm's goal. I will come to the issue of an emergent organizational intentionality now. Point eight, uh, can organizations intend at all? That is a question. Uh, and most methodological individualists uh, would deny it, not all, but most of them. But I, as mentioned above, consider the organization's goals, plans, strategies, and even employment contracts, incomplete as they may be, as cases of particular strong intentionality, of collective intentions as dealt with by, for example, John Searle, Margaret Gilbert, and even of corporate intentions in the, in the sense of, uh, uh, of the papers and books of uh, Philip Pettit. Um, now the question is, is it possible to sub substantiate and illustrate in a simple way the claim that corporate intentions and corporate acting cannot without rest to be reduced uh, to the intentions and actions of the organization's members. One way to refer, uh, one way is to refer to criminal acts. We will hear about this issue more in, in the afternoon. German criminal law, which does not recognize organizationsverschulden, organizational fault as fault of, but just of fault in organizations brought about by some members, is plainly unable to account for more uh, than just an unterlassen and failing, namely failing to provide sufficient organization and control. It is a kind of misdemeanor of members. Lack of control, however, is not the same as a criminal intent and energy. Corruption, money laundering, tax evasion, fraud, cartel building, and all the other machinations 
not spurned by firms such as Siemens, Volkswagen, and many other car producers, many banks, to name just these, do not come from some lack of organization and control, not from some passi unterlassen, but from an active intent. In a very practical sense, the approach of reductionism, bringing back all these activities to some members, misses the point. The really responsible agent, the corporate actor, that is. At least just two candidates of attribution, upper executives, for legal and pragmatic reasons, I cannot go into this issue, uh, hardly ever possible to get hold of, or minor members, henchmen, scapegoats, uh, possibly good people making bad decisions, decisions that is enabled and forced by the respective organization, by its culture, its rules, its resources, and its threats, execu executed by some executives, for their part, themselves forced by organizational rules, resources, threats, and culture. It is the organization's goal to which the agents adhere. One is tempted to say in this case of criminal acts, united even in a criminal spirit. The consent, however, as important as and uh, indispensable it may be, um, is a fractured, a fragmented one eclipsed by the labor market, often plagued by doubt, contaminated by dissent, sometimes even accompanied uh, by resistance. To paraphrase the subtitle of a German movie I saw 50 years ago, Lina Brake oder die Interessen der Bank können nicht die Interessen sein, die Lina Brake hat. The firm's interests cannot be the interests of their customers or for that matter, their members, ask Oliver Schmidt. This is what Elias Khalil stated in his paper. I quote, firms have interests which are quasi separate from the interests of the members. This separateness, separatedness is uh, what Khalil's uh, uh, idea is about. Thank you very much.